So, anyway. Yeah, of course you can. Passengers are advised to use caution when travelling, especially when boarding or alighting from trains, when standing on platforms, and when using stairs, as these may be more slippery than usual. Thank you. Yeah, so anyway, uh, since we're not going to be traveling much these days, I might as well start telling you a bit more about travel stories in different countries. Now let's focus on Lebanon. Uh, I was in Lebanon in July 2019. Uh, depending on how you count countries, I have to say it was like my 83rd nation, even though I'd been to a few UN like members who are a bit disputed like Kosovo and Vatican and um, you know you know like the, 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 there's some places you can call a country and some places you can't call a country yeah so I flew into Beirut airport on a Friday morning at around like 6 a.m. I'm just it is very easy for a Western person to get into like Lebanon you just have to have two things. No proof in your passport that you've been to Israel or occupied Palestine is what they say. And two, you need like a, a address and phone number of where you're staying. And also number three, uh, you need a return ticket. Like the only way you're gonna get into Lebanon these days is basically by flying to Beirut airport. You could get a ferry that goes from Turkey to um, Tripoli but that would take you at least over a day and then cost you about a hundred and twenty dollars according to the Thor who did this a couple of years ago and then there's always the case of like doing a tour like where you fly into Damascus and you leave via Beirut so I get to Cyprus uh, the airlines check in at Lanarka airport at like five in the morning hand over my passport but it leads us through she says have you ever been to Israel on this passport like not never. I mean, this is the closest I've ever been to Israel in my life. And then uh, I go through airport security, and then at the gate, you had to show a return ticket out of uh, Beirut before they let you on a plane. I mean, I, I always had my like paper itineraries, like this is going in, this is going out. So you just keep them together, and then also on the back of my itinerary, like I, I wrote my address and phone number where, where I was staying in Bishari. So, it's a short flight from Cyprus to uh, Beirut. I recommend like flying in uh, to Cyprus on either EasyJet or Ryanair and then getting a Cyprus Airways flight to Beirut. But uh, when things like reopen, there will be like Ryanair flights to Beirut, I, I hope so. And maybe Wizz Air in the future. So, I land at Beirut International Airport, and the funny thing is, they don't give me a form to fill out, that's what I'm expecting, I'm expecting to fill a form out. So I, I go to passport control, put my passport down, the man flips through like every page of my passport to check that I've not entered Israel via Jordan or Egypt, because that's a, like a did giveaway, and I don't have any Israeli stamps prior to them stop stamping passports back in the day. So he just asks, like, uh, are you a soldier? I'm like, no, I'm a chef. Because like basically it's, it's nice to say that you're a chef rather than you're a journalist. And uh, he asked me for an address and phone number. So I give him my address of my guest house in Bashari. I go through like immigration. He gives me a stamp and writes one month. And he says you can stay for one month. I'm like, oh, that's good. You know, One month is decent enough time in Lebanon even though I'm only here for the weekend. Yeah, so and this is over my next hurdle. I don't have any Lebanese pounds, I only got like US dollars, but US dollars are interchangeable, so basically you can buy stuff in Lebanon with US dollars and get your change in Lebanese pounds. So uh, basically like that's what I had to do throughout my trip. I pay the stuff in American dollars and get your change in Lebanese pounds, reasonably. Now, Beirut International Airport, they do not have, like, proper public transport. Alright, the only, basically, way you're going to get out of Beirut Airport is basically paying a flat fare of 25 or 30 US dollars for a taxi. You can always get an Uber, uh, but it's kind of, like, really hard to find an Uber driver to pick you up 
when basically you're going to be waiting outside the arrival halls for a while waiting for this person. But there are red vans, right? There are red vans that go all the way into town. So basically you just have to flag them down and you just have to say like, uh, Dora. Now, uh, remember I, I got in the van, I traveled through like the southern part of Lebanon, which is a bit risky and all, and, and that's where all the Shiites live. And then I ended up in like, I ended up having to get off the, the van and then get into like another one and take me to Dora. Now, once I got to Dora, um, my phones wasn't really working so well with maps. I had to figure a way out of how I'm going to get to Bashari. And like, I ask people like on the streets, like not Leb non-Lebanese people, I like, just... Like, I see some migrants from Sri Lanka, and they don't even speak English, and they're just working in, like, Lebanon, like a lot of third world nationals are. Uh, I ended up getting a taxi to drop me off at this uh, special station, which also doubles as a, a, t a ticket office or a bus stop. So you just say to the people you just want to go to Bashari, and then you just wait for the bus to turn up, you, get, you um, go on the bus. So at the time of this travel, I'm just really, like, really sleeping because I haven't like slept much. And so like I fall asleep for most of the ride up to Bashari. And the interesting thing was I finished off uh, Jackie Collins Rockstars before I arrived at Bashari. So I, I tell the guy, like I just want to go to where uh, like Carla Gibran has his museum. So he drops me off at the front gate and says like uh, it's all the way up there. I walk all the way up the hill to get to the Gibran Museum. And I noticed that there were like a lot of tourists there. I paid a total of 8,000 Lebanese pounds uh, for an entry ticket. So they give me a, a, a bunch of folders with a lot of information about all the artwork pieces he did. So you, you go into one room and they got like um, some of his drawings. You go into another room, there's paintings. You go into another room, you see his belongings. And you, you keep on going through the rooms and you're learning more about this man called Gibran who wrote the prophet. And then at the bottom of the museum is in the basement. He is buried. Like his silver casket is lodged into the wall and it says like on the top like I'm alive like you and I'm standing beside you. Close your eyes, look around, you can see me. And even it's even projected into the walls. So I had a really tearful moment because it, throughout my time in the museum I'm carrying a photograph of my late grandma, my late uncle Brian, I got my Dream Theater ticket, I got my Rosary Beads from Armenia, I'm just carrying them around, like holding them in my hot little hand. And so when I'm at the tomb of Carla Gibran, I'm like kneeling down there, and I'm, I'm, I'm praying, I'm praying for a good five minutes because this guy's tomb is really motivating me a lot. Because when my uncle had died in 2012, um, uh, like a friend of mine gave me some poetry of Carla Gibran, and I forgot who the hell he was. And then years later, I saw the Dream Theater, and then I was punched out after seeing Dream Theater that night. But Dream Theater had used the parts of like uh, Gibran's poetry in the song Breaking All Illusions, and I'd just seen Dream Theater in Slovakia a few nights prior, and I didn't get beaten up. So, the best thing I did after entering the museum is buying a copy of The Prophet, and it was stance to say that I bought it in Bashari and I would not want to give this away to somebody because even though my father has a a, a, a version of the prophet uh, I just think it's something I want to hold on to for the rest of my life and uh, well you know if I pass on well my niece and nephew can fight over it. Is there a particular bike in Parliament or is there any door? Any door. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, so uh, I stayed a night in Bashari, and I gotta tell you, it's a beautiful town. It's much more prettier than Beirut. I mean, no offense to Beirut, but there are just some parts of Beirut that are really tacky. Y you can drink the water from the fountains, and because there are so many fountains all over town that you can just drink the water straight out of the tap. It's just so amazing. But in Beirut, I don't think you can do that. And there's also a lot of churches and monasteries in the area. It's like really good for hikes. And so I was staying at Tiger Guest House up on the hills. It was really hard way to find it, but then I met some people 
who knew where it was, but they had lost their chicken. So I chased the chicken into a garden trying to catch it, and I'm not really good at catching chickens. I, I paid 25 US dollars a night uh, for a room in a sh like a bed in a shared room. I wouldn't really call it a hostel or a hotel, just a guest house. Uh, I had breakfast for an extra five US dollars, and I stupidly broke my tooth while stuffing like olives that had stones in them without checking them. So always make sure you check your olives for stones before you eat them. I left a few hours later after breakfast, and I had a. It was really sad for me to like to leave this part of uh, Lebanon. But I always knew that if I was ever to go back to Syria, I would stop off there and pray at Khalid Gibran's tomb for a second time before I go to Damascus. So I was saying to a Swedish woman, I said, I would love to go to Damascus on this trip, but it's too expensive for me because you need to be on a tour. And then she's debating me, saying if it's going to be safe or not. I, I say, well, just you just have to go to Damascus and follow the guidelines, and that's about it. I took the bus back into Beirut, and I stayed in this part of town in the uh, east. I walked through uh, the Armenian quarter of the town, Burjud Hamad. Sorry if I'm saying that wrong. And I met many Armenians whose ancestors had fled from one day Turkey to Lebanon. And when I was at a coffee shop, I said, now, Have any of you been to Yerevan? I said, Yes. And then he says, My co worker is from Damascus. And I was really buffed at meeting someone from Syria, an Armenian from Syria. <laughs> so, when I said this hostel, which. Uh, I can't really remember the name, but I had to pull upstairs and there were like so many like different foreigners I was talking to throughout the night and drinking many bottles of like Beirut beer. I just, it was a really good place to stay for, well, 11 bucks a night. Um, as for Beirut itself, I walked all the way from the downtown where all the um, parliament buildings and the mosques and the churches are. I walked all the way to Pigeon Rocks, that big like rock in the Mediterranean Ocean, Mediterranean Sea, and you can see boats like drive through it. But there were some parts of Beirut that like, I walked through and you couldn't even just buy alcohol. I wanted Beirut beer and they're like, sorry, I don't serve alcohol. I'm like, oh yeah, it's a Sunni Muslim part of it. They don't really serve alcohol. Fair enough. I'll, I'll just go to like a Christian part of Beirut that has alcohol. Yeah. And then on the Sunday, I went to an Armenian church in Bushu Hamond. And I stayed there for mass, just recommended from a friend of mine. I, uh, but, but then, like, I wanted to go to other places that had Armenian churches, but it was really hard because Beirut doesn't really have reliable transport. They don't really have, like, a good bus network. There's even a hop-on, hop-off bus in Beirut, but it's, like, $24, and it's really overpriced. So if you want to get around, like, Beirut, you just have to hop in a taxi and say service. And when you say that, it's much cheaper. Otherwise, you'd be paying like a shitload load of money. Now, getting back to Beirut Airport for my flight back to Cyprus, all I did was get a um, an Uber. I got an Uber to drive me from my hostel all the way to the airport for 13 American dollars. It's a good ride. It was the first time I ever used an Uber. Much better than like using a flat rate of 25 dollars. So I I got to the airport and I had wait a really long time to check into my flight and go through many different security and passport checks and even a, a passport check at the uh, gate before you leave to make sure you can out. So anyway, that explains my weekend in Beirut, Lebanon. And my best tips if you were to spend more time in Lebanon is have US dollars and basically have an open mind waiting around for buses. I mean, there will always be buses or taxis to go to places, but they won't like leave at certain fixed times. I'm over my melhead over and out.